This here is the new Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV. This is the flagship electric SUV from the brand. And here in Malaysia, it's priced at 700,000 ringgit, which I think is a bit of a bargain. That may sound absolutely absurd to you, but I will explain in a minute. It's very comfortable, surprisingly decent to drive, and it can seat seven adults. Not very well, but it can. It is also claimed to do over 600 kilometers on a single charge, but in the real world, it really can't. Full review of this thing coming up right now. Let's start with the prices. First, at 700,000 ringgit here in Malaysia, this is far from cheap or affordable. But at the same time, you really shouldn't expect it to be because this is a flagship SUV. Compared to other models of the same stature, say the Mercedes-Benz GLS, that is priced at 900,000 ringgit here in Malaysia. And in fact, here in Malaysia, we're talking about the base GLS 450 compared to the top-end EQS 580 here. In most other markets, you'd be paying about 40% more to buy this over the GLS, but here in Malaysia, it's the other way around. And if you look beyond Mercedes-Benz's, it gets even more interesting. Say in the UK, this is actually priced the same as a Bentley Bentayga. But here in Malaysia, you'll be looking at double the price, 1.5 million and up for the Bentley. So yes, the EQS SUV is not cheap, it's not affordable, but here in Malaysia, it's a bit of a bargain. Just like the EQE and the EQS, this is built on Mercedes's dedicated EV platform, but they're all running the slightly outdated 400 volt electrical architecture instead of the far more advanced 800 volt. And while the EQS sedan is manufactured in Germany and now assembled in Malaysia, this SUV comes from the land of large SUVs, the US of A. That also explains the fitment of Cooper tyres on this car, which I'm not a big fan of. I don't think it befits a Mercedes-Benz at all, let alone a flagship model like this one. On to styling, the EQ range has had a look of its own for quite a while now. That can be a good or a bad thing depending on your own personal preference, but the general take is that that's not quite the best look for Mercedes-Benz EVs. The EQS SUV, however, to me is the best looking EQ car by far. It has the same distinctive front end with a fully closed up front grille, Mercedes star radiating out from the center, a full width LED light and the general roundness of it all. But it escapes that rather weird soap bar shape of the sedans, that's a good thing. Proportionally, it does look a little bit like an American MPV and it does look a bit bloated from some angles. But at the same time, it does look far more conventional, especially compared to the far more controversial BMW iX. Just like both the EQE and the EQS sedan, this here runs without the traditional front fenders. Instead, the bonnet extends all the way to the sides, right down to the wheel arches. This is done to reduce shot lines and panel gaps. For instance, there's no longer that vertical line by the bonnet. That's all in the name of aero efficiency. But what hasn't been explained are the massive panel gaps around the side. I mean, I can fit an entire finger by a slot over here. But at least this is all consistent across all models so it's not the case of you know bad build quality in certain Teslas. As for the wheels in Malaysia as standard we are getting the massive 22 inches but like I said before it's wrapped in Cooper tires. As you can see, this is a big and massive SUV at over 5.1 meters long with a wheelbase of over 3.2 meters. This is one of the biggest cars on the road in Malaysia today. You can also clearly tell that this is a full size bigger than the regular BMW iX. On the side, it has the usual Mercedes-Benz bits. The illuminated pop-out door handles still look far better than they are to actually use. And the side step actually go a step further. They are both bad to look at and not very comfortable to use. They are still far too narrow to be used comfortably. And I just don't get why Mercedes-Benz of all brands can't fit those fancy deployable side steps like a lot of other people would. 
At the back, the EQS SUV has a very simple, clean, almost generic shape to it. I do like the Helica light graphics back here, but beyond that, there's really not much else going for it. Thankfully, the interior is far more interesting. Inside, if you've been in an EQS sedan, this will feel very, very familiar to you. It's practically the exact same dashboard in this SUV. And just like the sedan, while the exterior gets the full AMG line package, the interior is dressed up in the electric art package. This includes the standard steering wheel instead of the sportier AMG line steering, as well as all these fancy rose gold elements. But the main feature, of course, is this full-width hyper screen. It includes three separate displays, one for the driver for the digital display, a big screen in the middle that houses all your main interface, and of course, wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which looks fantastic, by the way, full screen. That just looks great. And a secondary screen on the far left for the front passenger. That, however, is more for show than anything else. It doesn't really do much, but yeah, as a whole, it does look pretty impressive. As a thing to impress your friends and business partners, this is absolutely top notch. But while all that is well and good, plus the material work is pretty decent as well, the actual construction in here isn't all that good. For instance, the top of the dashboard can be easily moved by just pressing it down. That doesn't sound too high quality. And then, yeah, there are plenty of cheap parts in this so-called flagship model. That's not so good. Even the top panel over here feels pretty flimsy if you press it. So yeah, flagship SUV, it feels about the same as a regular GLC inside. That's half the price. On the other hand, this cabin isn't without its merits. Because of the far more upright seating position, the angle of the screen feels much better in here compared to the more low-slung EQS sedan. And then this is one of the rare right-hand drive Mercedes-Benz models with a proper footrest and a wide footwell. That's always a nice thing. Plus, the front seats are also pretty comfortable. It's not quite proper S-Class comfortable, but compared to, say, the GLC, GLE, or even the GLS, this is an upgrade. I also like the bare wood panels with the Mercedes stars popping out. I think that's really classy, as well as the suede-like material on top of the dashboard and the center armrest over here. It all feels very, very premium and expensive indeed. But at the same time, I'm still not a big fan of all the touch controls in the center over here, especially on the steering wheel, as well as the seat memory controls. I think the older buttons work much better. Back here, it's pretty spacious as you would expect, and you can even slide the seats back and recline the backrest through the side controls over here. For your reference, I am 167 centimeters tall. I've got plenty of leg room left and huge amount of headroom back here. But the amount of space aside, the level of adjustment available back here is pretty disappointing. For instance, this is as reclined as the middle row seats can go. I would have expected it to go further reclined still. And then there's the seat itself, which is decent, but nowhere near the best. It feels rather flat back here, not extremely supportive. And while the front seats do offer full ventilation, massage functions, the rear seats only offer seat heating functions. That's pretty lame. On the bright side, this being a big and tall SUV, you don't get the usual high floor issue like in most other EVs. The floor is relatively low and it's flat as well, so you can just as easily fit three adults in the back here with no issues at all. The problem is the center seat, as usual, is not very comfortable at all. In Malaysia, as standard, you get these two rear screens back here and you've got the exact same controls as in the front center screen. The idea is, as the boss back here you can just put in your navigation controls and your driver in front will follow it but unfortunately here in Malaysia pretty much nobody uses the onboard navigation maps and you cannot control Apple CarPlay from the rear screen so it doesn't really have all that much functionality you can of course fit external HDMI devices like a Kindle Fire or a Google TV where you can watch your streaming apps through the rear screens but even then you'll have devices hanging down there it wouldn't be a good look at all. On the plus side, this is one of the very first Mercedes-Benz models to have Dolby Atmos sound system. So if you play high fidelity audio through the sound system, it will sound absolutely fantastic. 
Another highlight is this detachable tablet within the center armrest. With this, you can control either sides of the screens. You can even close up the top sun blind in this car and even control the air cons if you can't be bothered to reach down there for the controls. But having said that, the screen itself looks rather low res compared to all the high res screens around this car. Access to the last row is relatively good. At a touch of a button, the middle row will fold forward with ease and even the frontmost seat will move forward slightly to open up as much space as possible to climb into the back here. Unfortunately, once you're inside, you'll quickly realize these seats are meant more for children and not for adults. This seat over here isn't even in its rearmost position and my knee is already jammed up into it. So yeah, if you're any taller than me, which of course most of you are, you just would not fit in the back here. Likewise, my hair is already touching the ceiling. And then there is the build quality back here. This cheap piece of trim would not fit a Honda, let alone a flagship Mercedes. On a positive note, you do get your own dedicated aircon vents back here as well as four USB-C chargers. I don't know why you would need four chargers for two passengers, but yeah, you've got them. As a whole though, it's pretty clear that this is more of a 5 plus 2 rather than a full 7-seater. And even then, it works far better as a spacious 5-seater SUV rather than a 7-seater of any form. As for the boot, with all seats up, you get just under 200 litres of space. It's nice and wide and rather deep, so you can fit a few duffel bags in there, no problem. But due to the sloping aperture, you can't fit your cabin size luggages vertically, which does limit the use of the boot over here. Another drawback is that you can't fit your charging cables under the floor, so that bag over there is always going to take up space in your boot. As mentioned, this SUV works far better as a five-seater. You can fold down the last row seats as easily as this, which opens up a space of 800 litres. That is properly massive. Beyond that, you can even fold the second row seats down using these electric buttons over here. That's pretty handy. All right, finally on the move with the Mercedes-Benz EQS 580 SUV. As mentioned, this is the top of the line 580 version, which means it's the quickest of them all. This has a dual motor all wheel drive setup and it has 544 PS, 858 Newton meters of torque in total. So, despite this being a big, massive, heavy SUV, it takes off like an absolute rocket. It can go from 0 to 100 in just 4.6 seconds. In feel, this is as quick, as explosive as a true blue AMG model. But it does that without any drama. It just shoots forward without any sound at all. You can think of the absolute best W12, V12 Rolls Royces, Bentleys, or even the Toyota Centuries. This is better, more refined than all of them. That to me is the absolute beauty, the best part of a flagship electric vehicle. The level of refinement offered here is just unparalleled, way better than pretty much anything that has come before. This EQS SUV of course has full double glazing all around, so you just don't hear anything. There is no engine note to speak of and there is very little wind noise coming in at all not even when you're cruising along at 140, 150. You do get a tiny bit of tyre roar coming in that perhaps has something to do with the rather budget tyres. I can only imagine how quiet this car would feel with quality premium rubber all around. But back to the performance, it is electric. Just look at that. This to me feels even more powerful than the BMW iX50, let alone all other inferior electric vehicles. The fact that it is this fast and this refined is just mind-boggling. With the EQS, both the sedan and even this SUV, Mercedes-Benz has come to the absolute top of the pinnacle of luxury automobiles. This is the most refined car there ever was. 
But of course, everything comes with a price. To make this car so quick and so refined, they've had to add on, you know, probably a hundred kilos of extra sound deadening and far more powerful electric motors. So the efficiency suffers along with it. This is easily the biggest, heaviest electric vehicle I've tested on Malaysian roads. So obviously it has the highest power consumption I've recorded yet. But at 21 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, that is also way higher than I expected. Against this car's maximum battery capacity of 107.8 kilowatt hours, I can work out a maximum range of around 515 kilometers. That's not too bad. That's pretty decent considering the size and the level of performance, of course. But compared against Mercedes's own claim of over 600 kilometers of range, yeah, it doesn't add up. I mean, had Mercedes-Benz claimed 500 kilometers for this car, it would still be mighty impressive. But it claims 600, it only does 500, so yeah, there is that big gap in terms of customer expectations that are not going to be met ultimately. 500 kilometers for a car this big is absolutely fine. I mean, as it is, I've only got 22% of charge left and it still says I can go another 126 kilometers. That's more than enough for another day or even two, depending on how far you drive every single day. So in terms of range, this car to me is more than enough for most people. It's just the fact that Mercedes claims more than this car can actually do in the real world. As for charging, this EQS SUV is actually above average. It has a 22 kilowatt AC onboard charger, which means it can top up its massive battery from 0 to 100% in just about 5 hours. This is an optional extra in most other countries, but we are getting it as standard here in Malaysia. That's a very good thing. As for DC fast charging, this has a maximum rate of 200 kilowatts. So we can go from 10 to 80% SOC in as little as 31 minutes. That's pretty standard for most EVs these days, but it's still not as impressive as EVs with 800 volt electrical architecture. This, like I said, still runs on the slightly older 400 volt architecture. Now onto the one thing that I think is the best feature of the EQS SUV, its ultimate ride quality. This is one of the best riding electric SUVs, electric vehicles I've tested yet, which is to be expected really. This is the most expensive, this is the biggest, this is the most luxurious EV out there. But still though, the combination of comfortable ride and dynamic handling is something that we have yet to see in an electric vehicle. I mean, if you've only driven a BYD Auto 3, you may think all electric SUVs have floppy steering. If you've only driven, say, a Volvo C40 or a BMW iX, you may think all electric SUVs have a busy and harsh ride. This, however, manages to feel supremely comfortable and surprisingly agile at the corners as well. That goes to show how much proper tuning and technology can refine a car to the next level. To me, this rides even better than the EQS sedan. You just sit so much higher, you have a much more comfortable seating position overall, you're not so much sitting on the floor like in the low slung sedan. This to me just has a much, much better seating riding position overall. There is that level of floatiness, that level of looseness that you've come to expect with air suspension cars, but here it feels very, very controlled, even in comfort mode. The way the EQS SUV smoothens out all the undulations on the highways is just absolutely amazing. Even in the back, you hardly feel any bumps at all. Even at low speeds, through those you know annoying rubber speed bumps, you sort of feel that the front is a little bit stiff, a little bit oversprung, but the rear suspension is absolutely beautiful. It glides through everything. Sitting in the back, this is easily one of the most comfortable electric vehicles out there. And then we come to the handling. The steering is really quick, very direct, and together with the rear wheel steering, it actually dances around corners. Nothing that you would expect from a car this big and this tall. 
in terms of eating up corners, I would say that this is on par with the BMW iX, which in itself was already impressive in the handling department, I think. This being as comfortable as it is, being as, you know, soft and pillowy on the highways, through the corners, it can hold its own. That's just unbelievable. That's really, really good engineering, I think. Ultimately, this isn't a car that you are going to take corners really quickly in because you do end up getting a lot of body roll. But if you must, it can take it. Trust me, it can. The four-wheel steering system is also another highlight of the EQS SUV. It makes maneuvering this car through tight city streets, tight parking lots, a complete breeze. You don't feel that this is any bigger than, say, a Mercedes GLC, even though clearly, physically, this is much wider, much, much longer. But fitting this big SUV into tight parking lots, yeah, really, really easy. This is a feature that I hope moving forward gets fitted into more and more Mercedes-Benz models here in Malaysia. It is a game changer. I've already touched on refinement earlier, so let's move on to the active safety systems on this car. As you would expect, this has pretty much everything a car like this can offer. It gets level 2 semi-autonomous driving, it has active lane keep assist, adaptive cruise control, and so on. But for some reason, it doesn't really work all that well on this particular car. I'm not sure whether it's a software issue on this car alone or it's on all EQS SUVs because it's just so big and heavy. But somehow it doesn't feel as secure, as confident in sticking the car to the center of the lane as other Mercedes-Benz models with similar technologies. As it is, it is a little bit disappointing in terms of steering control, but in terms of adaptive cruise control, the way it controls the pedals, both the throttle and braking, it is still one of the best out there. In terms of passive safety, this is also superior compared to most of its rivals. This has nine airbags, the usual six, plus a driver knee airbag, as well as a pair of rear seat side airbags. So in case you do get into a crash, you are much safer in this car compared to most other cars out there. Plus the fact that this has big and heavy battery pack at the bottom of the platform makes the center of gravity far lower than conventional cars, so it's far less likely to ever turn turtle or turn over, even in the most major of accidents. So in summary, the EQS SUV is supremely fast, even electric as some would call it. It's also surprisingly agile to drive, quite enjoyable, and as you would be expecting it to be, it's also extremely comfortable. It is the complete package, I think. If you're shopping in this price range, you're looking for the most comfortable car any electric vehicle can offer, you're looking at it right now. So that's my full review of the new Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV here in Malaysia. All in all, it is a very comfortable and spacious SUV and it works far better as a flagship car compared to the EQS sedan. At the same time, it is also supremely quick and surprisingly agile and dynamic to drive. It's also far more substantial and far more luxurious compared to the BMW iX, fully justifying the price premium. On the other hand, its build quality really isn't up to the standard it should be, and it works far better as a five-seater rather than a seven-seater it is being marketed as. It's the same with the range as well. You can quite comfortably get 500 kilometers in this car on a single charge, but it's nowhere close to the 600 that Mercedes-Benz promises. Everything considered though, I still think this is a really good flagship electric SUV. It looks decent, definitely distinctive enough, and like I said in the beginning, it's a bit of a bargain here in Malaysia. I would never choose this over a Bentley Bentayga, for instance, but at half the price, this starts to make a lot more sense. So what do you think of this car and the full review? Do let me know in the comments section below. For now, thank you for watching and stay safe everyone.